chapter 16 is where we find our text this evening. And set the, set the uh, what I tried to lay a foundation this morning, the message. Just a reminder, as we have uh, this month of stewardship. Stewardship is not a subcategory in your life that you give attention to just when you have something. It is really a way of life. And uh, the Lord Jesus puts that in front of the people. And here in this passage of Scripture, he's talking primarily to his disciples. He's trying to help them understand that life is stewardship. That does not just involve money, but it does involve money. It starts with money. I think it's amazing how that, that a man or a woman who will rob from the Lord and will not be serious about their money, there's no telling what they'll do. And uh, they'll, they'll be messed up in other areas of their life. But it's time, it's talent, it's training, it's trials, it's your family, it's your car, it's your house, it's your possessions. It's, it's, it is all of that involved. And uh, in the Bible, there are three main parables that Jesus gave, uh, gave that revolve around stewardship. And the word steward is a word we would say today is manager. A steward is someone who doesn't own anything, he merely manages and stewards something for someone else. And there are, three, there are three parables specifically about stewardship in our Bible. Matthew chapter 5, 25 is the, is the parable about the, th the three men. One is given five talents, one given th two talents, and one given one talent. And of course, uh, a talent would be an equivalent of six figures today, so at least probably $100,000 in today's uh, thing. You know, you think about the man who just got one talent. It means he got equivalent of about $100,000. And he just felt like, you know, I can't, trust the, I can't trust the man for that, and so he just buried it. But he, and he said the one with five, he gave that. We'll talk about that another time. The one with two doubled his, and the one with one buried his or held on to it. And when the master came back, he handed it back to them and said, you know, I've given yours. He said, why didn't you just at least put it in the bank and get some interest? Why did you just sit on it? He said, well, because I know how you are. I know that you're an austere man, and I, I feared you because I know that you, you try to reap a harvest where you don't sow any seeds. And and you're just not fair, and you only gave me one, you gave him five, and made excuses, and the Lord Jesus didn't really care about his excuses. He got angry and frustrated with them and gave him a very harsh uh, rebuke. The other parables in Luke 19, and that has to do with uh, the, he could, he, the people with him. He was going toward Jerusalem. They were excited about him being the king in that time. He says, listen, let me tell you a story. There was a man who had a wealthy man, and he gave 10 of his, ten of his servants ten, a, a pound each. And he, he went away, and he came back, and there uh, he expected to do something. He met with each of them, and most of them took what he gave them and, and profited. They did well. And he said one of them didn't, and of course he gives also a scathing rebuke to him. And just a couple thoughts about that before we get into our passage tonight. Just a couple things you need to evaluate. Number one, in each of those stories, and the last one being the one we just read with Brother Colston, Jesus, or God, is the master. You need to understand a couple things about the master. The master owns everything. The, 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 the earth is the Lord and the fullness therein, the world and all they that dwell therein. In, in uh, Job chapter 41, verse number 10, the Lord says, everything under heaven is mine. In Haggai 2.8, he says, the gold is mine, the silver is mine. In Deuteronomy and Leviticus, he says over and over again, I own everything. Everything belongs to God. And that would be a good day in our life. Now, we all would say that, oh, yeah, everything belongs to God. But our lives betray what we say. Because when someone scratches your car and you get fired up and blow, blow a gasket over a scratch in your car, you know why you got so fired up? Because it wasn't God's car. It was yours. When someone steals something from you, I, I remember hearing a story of, uh, I don't remember if it was John Wesley or John, uh, Jonathan Edwards, but 
a man rolled his horse up to John Edwards, and he was just finished preaching to me. He said, Mr. Edwards, and he was frantic. He said, this is terrible. I got something terrible to tell you. I don't know what to tell you, but your house burned down tonight. Burned to the ground. And what Edwards said to him, he said, well, well, that wasn't my house. That was God's house, and that's one less thing I have to take care of now. That's a pretty spiritual thing to say, and I don't think I would ever say that. But he understood stewardship. That wasn't his house. That was God's house. And if God wanted to burn the ground, that was his business. Our children, our home, or things like that. It's a mentality. And the mentality you understand about the master is that he owns everything. Number two, the master is all-powerful. He is the authority. He is the, he is the, he's the, he's an authority. He can choose what he wants to do. He owes me nothing. What he gives me is up to him. He draws the rules, and I live by those rules. And he wants me to have one child or nine children or no children. It's his decision. If he makes me six foot four or four foot six, that's his decision. If he makes me the oldest child in the family, the youngest child in the family, that's his decision. If he, took my, if he allowed my dad to go home to be with the Lord when I was six years old, or when I was 26 years old, if he lets my mom live till she's 95, as I heard a lady today say that her mom is 95, that's his business. Because he really has ultimate control. He, he can decide what he wants to do. If he wants to give some guy five, five talents and someone else two talents, that's God. He knows everything. He knows the past and the beginning. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And he's the master. And we oftentimes want to second guess, second guess God. And I don't necessarily think it's wrong to try to evaluate things. The Bible says prove all things, hold that fast, that which is good. But we do know we have a God whose ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher. He has a, uh, he has a heaven's view of situations. You have, a, you have a horizontal view, not the vertical view. And he's the boss. and we're the, He's the potter. We're the clay. We see the, sir, the master here uh, in all, all of those. He is ultimately all-powerful. He can do whatever he wants. And that's not bad because he's a good God. Everything, everything good you've ever experienced in your life, every good meal, every kind affection that you've ever experienced, it came at the hand of a God who loved you. But he owns everything, and that means I own nothing. If I say, well, that's my house, I'm really, it's not true. I have it because God gave me. Oh, I lost my health. Well, it's not really my health. We lost our child when he was 17 years old, and we, we call him our son, our son Tyler. But the truth of the matter is, Linda and I had to, had to really get sober for a few minutes and remind ourselves that we understood that before he went to heaven, but we need to understand it after he went to heaven that he never was. The Lord gave and the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You really have to understand ownership. If you don't understand ownership, you're going to get bitter and frustrated and you probably quit. If you don't understand authority, that God is in authority. In each of these, these parables, the, the, whoever the master was, he was sovereign. He owned everything. He also entrusted I don't understand all this, but the, the, the master entrusts things to your care. He entrusts you with talents. He entrusts you with money. He entrusts you with decisions. He entrusts you with time. Everything is a little bit varied and up to his decisions, but he gives you things, and he's always watching how you handle those things. The Bible tells us very clearly in the book of Chronicles that the eyes of the Lord, they run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of him whose heart is perfect toward him. It doesn't matter if you're a girl or a boy. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter if you are single or married. God is watching you. And he's trying to know, can I trust you? Can I entrust it? And everything God's given us already, he's expressed uh, confidence in us. One of the things I love about the, the man, 
uh, Abraham. And Abraham, in Genesis 18, 19, the Bible says, you know, basically, I know him. He says, should I tell Abraham? Should we tell him what we're going to do? And he said, I know him. He will guide his children. At that time, he didn't have any kids. He said, but if I tell him something, I know he'll, he'll do it. Interesting, Abraham was a man not only who trusted God, but he was a man who God trusted. And you see, each of the masters gave confidence, their confidence in somebody who served for them. I find also that these, these masters all had expectations. They had expectations, and expectation was profit. They wanted them to do what they could with what he gave them. He was not satisfied with just me turning him back over what he gave me and say, okay, here's what I did the best I can. He really wasn't impressed with the best I could do. He doesn't want, he wants, he wants there to be some sort of benefit done for the kingdom of God and for me and for you. He has a purpose for why he invested. He had expectations and his expectations are very clear. I want you to do something with what I gave you to do. My response was, I've given you, I want you to do it. I, I, interesting to me is that in all three of them, of the stewardship parables, the master leaves. He, he, he exits their life for a time. And then he comes back again. And of course, that's what God has done for us. Jesus did not stay here. He's been gone for almost 2,000 years. And he's going to come again. Each of the, each of the stewardship parables, the, the master is, has spaced out his time with them. He leaves, and he has another time to come back. And, and when he comes back, there's a reckoning. Each time he comes back, he doesn't just come and pat him on the head and say, you know, I, I hope everything went good. He said, tell me what happened. What would you do? What'd you make? With what I gave you, how'd you do with that? So there was, there was definitely, uh, he had an agenda, he had expectations, and he, uh, I don't think it was necessarily real comfortable. When he came back, he said, when I come back, I want to talk to you. In our story tonight that we talk about, the master says, I, I, I may fire you. He said, but I'll give you some time. And, and in that time, the, the servant did some things very shrewdly, wisely, somewhat, according to his master. Then I find that the, the stewardship parables involve the generosity of the Lord. The Lord was very glad and said, Enter thou to the joy of my Lord. He said, Come on in. Well done. You have been faithful in little things. I'll make you ruler in much. Luke chapter 19, he says, I'm going to... I'm going to give you some cities here and some cities there. So I mean, you've shown great fidelity in what I gave you. I want to do it more. You might remember Peter saying to the Lord Jesus Christ, we've left all to follow you. What is it for us? And he said, oh, man, no one has left father, mother, sister, brother for my sake in the gospel that I'll not reward them 10,000%. Can you imagine that? A hundredfold. It's, I mean, it's, it blows your mind how good God wants to be to you and I. And yet we don't trust him. That's, my, that's our issue. The just shall live by without. It's impossible to please him. So much of life is learning to trust the Lord. To trust him for $10, trust him for $10,000, trust him for $100,000, trust him to use you, to help you. So much of what we do is we don't do because we do not trust God. People steal because they don't trust God. They cheat on their income tax because they don't trust the Lord. Uh, people don't go soul winning because they don't trust that God will use them. They're too nervous, too afraid. And fear and faith are polar opposites. I've had that problem sometimes. I, I have a gospel track. I know I should expend it. I should give it to someone. The Spirit of God's talking to me about it, but I'm nervous. Why am I nervous? Because I'm, I don't trust the Lord. That's what God wants me to do, and I'm, I'm not obeying Him. And really, faith is trusting God enough to obey Him. 
We also learn about the master is that, that uh, he does have expectation standards of accountability that he will do. Um, to the servant, I think we can learn something about the servants. The servants understood a couple things. It wasn't about rights. It was about responsibility. When you don't own anything, it's not really about your rights. It's about your responsibility. And we need a revival responsibility. They understood it was faithfulness. Well done, thou good and it wasn't flashiness. It was just being faithful with what God had given them. I think they understood that it involved industry or work. And this is oftentimes the reason why people do not serve the Lord because it's stinking hard. Some of you, your heart was tugged tonight as you watch about the, the nursing home. Probably someone, someone, the Spirit of God probably said, you know what, you ought to do that. that you can do that. You can gather 6, 10, 12, 15 people around you on a Tuesday morning or a Wednesday morning or a Wednesday afternoon or a Saturday morning. You could do that. But then you say, you know, but then I wouldn't be able to Go, go do other things, or I'd have to take time to drive over there, or it's going to cost gas money, or, or it's going to be hard. I'll have to interact with people and have to arrange it and have to be, make commitment. Oh, good night. I don't want people having to depend upon me because I, you know, I may not be able to do it all the time. I want to take this and do that. And oftentimes, it's work that makes us afraid. But the people who were given responsibility by the master understood First of all, it was about responsibility. Number two, it involved the criteria of faithfulness, but it would be industry. It would be work. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, but it was going to have to be work. Be steadfast, unmove, always bound the work of the Lord. I must work the works of him who sent me while this day. I love our church for many reasons, but I especially love the hardworking people of our church. I love the work ethic that's here. But the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of lazy people in our church. People that, you know, that they, they're, you know, that they're not involved. They, you know, sometimes a local church can be like a, a professional football game. You know, it's, it's 60,000 people who can exercise watching 22 guys need a break. <laughs> and sometimes that's what happens in church. The same people. Can anyone help with that? The same people put their hands up. The other ones just watch them put their hand up. Something easy done? Well, I hope somebody's going to do that. That'd be good. That's a good thing to get involved with. I'm glad we're doing that. But they're not interested in getting Gatorade or helping with that. That's, not, that's somebody's going to do it. I'm glad somebody's doing that. But that sounds like a lot of work to me. Some others are thinking, you know, how are they putting those baskets together? Can I help Brother Mark? Let me, I'll help you put that together. Or that, that, that nursing home. Brother Edgars, what's that number again? Let me talk to you about that. Work is involved, and I think also wisdom. Having to choose what is best. What is the best use of my time? What's the best use of my spending? And remember, if the money is God's money, then really he ought to be consulted. Say, Lord, do you want your money spent there? Is that the best use of money? And I think it's not wrong. The Bible says it's good for a man to enjoy the fruit of his labor. He tells his people, sometimes eat the sweet. Enjoy something good that I've given you. It's not a time for your labor. I want you to rest. But I think we oftentimes ought to say to the Lord, what is the best thing I could do here? What do I really ought to do? Because sometimes God will say, hold, hold the phone, Joan. I don't want you doing that yet. But we push our way and we get things done and we have to, we have to go through the air or the consequences of that. But the master, the, the, the stewards, while the, the master was gone, had to continually evaluate, what do I do with what the master gave me? What's the best way? Because I don't know when he's coming back. So when he comes back, a man went to, uh, went to a beautiful, it was a, a wealthy man who owned a, 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 an estate, and, and he went there, and he said, he, and, and the gardener was out there, and he said, man, things are immaculate. He said, how, I said, is the master here? He says, the man who owns, is he here? He goes, no, no. He said, how long has he been gone? He said, I don't know that he's, he's been here in maybe, uh, maybe six, seven months. He said, it's beautiful. When do you expect him to come back? He said, today, of course. People who live in light of the re imminent return of Christ usually live a more elevated life. They get things a little bit better. They're They're careful. I'd be stuck with a lot of stuff when I should have invested it in the deeds of my in the deeds of the Lord. 
It takes some wisdom to do that. It isn't, logic is not a good idea always. Now, sometimes faith and logic are polar opposites. But it does take some wisdom in saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? How many kids would you like me to have? Who would you, who, what would you like to use my time to do? Where would you want me to go? Would you want me to take a vacation to Dominican Republic? We were looking forward to going over here and doing that. But Lord, would you want me to do that? Would you want me to evaluate? What would you want me to do with my time? Should I do that job? Should I not do that job? No, I'll give some more money, but I'll miss about all these, these services and things. Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't do that. What is the wisdom involved with that? The servant has to evaluate that. And then, of course, I think the anticipation of the return of their master. Uh, the Apostle Paul said that I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth is laid for me a crown of righteousness. And not to me only, but for anyone who loves what? His appearing. Looking forward to the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was also in the mindset of there. You know, it's amazing to me. We have so many um, kind of goofy doctrines regarding eschatology. One of the more popular ones today is that, is that we're going to go through the tribulation or a mid-tribulation uh, rapture. I personally believe that Jesus could come at any time and then we start the this, this seven-year tribulation and then the millennium. I believe that the Bible is very clear about that. But it's interesting today, just along with other things, Calvinism and, and some other things, now, now they're, they're really propelling the, the fact that we're going to go through the tribulation and the Lord's going to come back here and they're trying to figure out some ways to explain that biblically. But you know, I think a lot of it is to try to keep people from anticipating the coming of Christ. You don't always hear about the rapture. But boy, I tell you what, it's something we ought to preach about. God, Jesus talked about coming again. It's something we ought to think about. You know, people who don't want to hear about the rapture are people who are going to get married next month. You know, they don't want to get here about the rapture. Excited about, man, we want to, I want to be together with my spouse. I'm looking forward to spending these time and doing some things together. And, uh, but, but the truth of the matter is, we ought to be living in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anticipation of His coming. We also see an understanding of responsibility. And then, of course, the character of God. And that really these men understood, these servants in our stories of, of stewardship parables, understood they had only one person to please. They had to live in an audience of one. They couldn't just spend their time and compare themselves to each other, and that's unwise, but they really understood that, that I might know him. The Apostle Paul, one of the things I think that God used him so greatly is that he was passionate about the Lord Jesus. He was looking forward to him coming or going. He said, man, for me to live is to die is gain. So it's about him. I might know him. And even the hard times, the fellowship of his suffering, I don't care. I want to know him. And they live in an audience of one. And these are things that we see in the parables of the stewardship. Let's go to our parable to this evening. Let me, if I can, quickly give this scenario. And let's continue in verse number one. And he said unto the disciples, there was a certain rich man, which had a steward or manager, and the same was accusing to him that he had wasted his good. So men had come to, to the rich man and said, listen, this guy over here, we'll call, him, we'll call him Joe. We'll say, Joe's over here, and Joe is not doing a good job in your, in your business. He's wasting what you've given him. He has no clue what's going on. Now, Joe lived in the owner's house. The, everything that Joe had was owned by the, by the rich man. The house that he lived in, the, the horse that he rode on, the donkey that he rode on, the, the chariot or the, um, the, the wagon that he had, his wife, his kids all got fed from the salary that the owner gave him. So everything he had, he owned nothing. But he had been wasteful, or at least he was accused of being wasteful to his boss from his colleagues. Look at verse number 2. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? He said, What in the world? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be steward. He said, Look, I've been told that you've been wasteful. I can't believe that with you, Joe. He said, you give an account of your stewardship because you may no longer be 
my manager. I'm thinking about firing you. Well, Joe walks out of that little gathering, and here's what he said in verse number three. The steward said within himself, as he walked out in his mind, he said, what am I going to do? What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship I cannot dig. Maybe he said, I, I, he's got a bad back, or he's old, or he's lazy. And, and the bag, I'm ashamed to go around and ask people for stuff. I've been a manager. I've been in charge. And to go around, I, I'd be it's terribly embarrassed to go around and say, hey, man, can you let me live in your house? Can you, can you help me feed my family for a little bit? Or can you, uh, can you give me a little loan here? And Because I, I can't do that. I, I have been self-sufficient. People have admired me now to go do that. I can't beg and, and to dig. I don't, I'm not doing it. I can't do it. Then he said, but I'm resolved what to do. Verse number four. When I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Then he had an idea. Bingo. He said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm resolved. I have made a decision. Here's what I'm going to do. So that when I get fired from my job and I have to move out of the boss's house, I no longer have money. I no longer have a horse. I no longer have a wagon. I no longer have transportation. I have nothing that my friends will receive me into their house and let me stay with them for a while. So he started thinking, I know what I'm going to do. Look, if you would please, in the next verse, verse number five. So after he got this idea, he said, I, he called in everyone his Lord's debtors, anyone who owed his boss money, unto him and said unto the first, how much owest thou to my Lord? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, sit, take thy bill and sit down quickly and write 50. So he, he, he calls everyone who owes his boss money. And when he does, he says, uh, how much do you owe my Lord? I think the one of the reasons he asked is because he has no earthly idea. He has not done his invoices. He doesn't know how much they owe him. He's on the honest system. But he says, okay, now how much do you owe my Lord? And the guy said, well, I owe him 100 measures of wheat or oil. He said, well, give me that bill. Give me your bill real quick. Let me change that. Sit down quickly, cross out 50, cross out 100 and put 50. Now you only owe 50. And the guy said to Joe, Joe, you're unbelievable. He said, you know how we're having a hard time and you help me and I'll never forget you. And Joe, listen, if you ever need something, you let me know. You know, you know, bring the wife and kids over and eat at my house and spend some time with us. And Joe in the back of his mind said, oh yeah, sooner than you think. Oh, yeah. He said, no, no, don't worry about that right now. I just want to take care of you. I want him to take care of you. It's okay. And the guy walked away. He's so happy. Went home and told his wife, told the family, look, it's unbelievable, man. What Joe did for me is unbelievable. And then the next guy said, how much do you owe my Lord? He said, 100 measures of wheat. He said, sit down. Let's change that real quickly. Let's mark out 80. Let's mark out 100 and put 80. And the guy says, Joe, oh, you know, I was thinking about taking my business to Lowe's, but I'm not. I'm staying with you, man. He said, you are a good guy, Joe. You're amazing. Thank you for helping me. You know that I was going through a hard time, and you gave me a break. And I, I'll never forget that. Joe, we've got to do lunch sometime. And Joe's saying, oh, yeah, sooner than you think. We're going to do lunch. I mean, a lot more than lunch. And one by one, Joe begins to cut deals with these men. Oh, you, I don't know, maybe he took his commission out. Maybe he... He, uh, he overcharged them and just took out that and just said, you know, I'm just going to cut my losses. I won't get paid anything on this thing, but I'll make sure. Or maybe he really cheated the boss. I don't know. But what happened after he did that with those people, Joe became very popular in his community. I could just see him going out to McDonald's to get a cup of coffee in the morning. The guy that he gave a discount to said, no, Joe, you're not buying that. That's on me, man. Here, here don't you let him take his money. His money's no good. Here, why don't you get take care of that? Everywhere Joe got, people waving, hey, Joe, love you, man. You're a good guy. Well, thank you for looking out for the little guy. Joe's going, no problem, no problem, no problem. I'm sure that his boss probably got some attention, too. I could imagine his boss maybe going to the local tea shop and a man came up to him and said, you know, Mr. Omar, I'm sure that you, uh, you don't know this, but I tell you, we love Joe. You got a good man in Joe. So that Joe is, and thank you for giving me that discount. He said, what discount? I said, oh, Joe, he really helped me. I was in a bad way, and he cut me some slack. And he said, well, how much discount? Half. What? <laughs> he said, Mr. Omar, you, you, I was thinking about taking my business to Home Depot, but not now. We're staying with you. 
And everywhere the boss went, the boss is popular, Joe's popular, and the boss figures out, I know what Joe's doing. And then the boss commends Joe. Look at the verse of Scripture, if you would, please. Verse number 8, I believe, where we'll find it. And the Lord, notice the Lord is, uh, is it capitalized in your Bible? No, it's not because it's not Jesus. Jesus is telling the story, but he says, the boss commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. He had done something very, very shrewd and wise for the children of this world and their generation, wiser than the children of light. He said, this guy is smarter, and he evaluated that his time was short. I told him I was going to fire him if he didn't come up with his stuff. He didn't come up with his stuff, but he used his time to make friends. So that when he did get fired, he had friends who would receive me into, ever, into, into their homes. That would care for him. That would be his friend in this lifetime whenever he got fired. And the Lord said, the guy is smart. Now, he probably still got fired. We don't know that. It's not given here. It's a story. But it's a story from God's son, Jesus, to us and telling us, this guy did something pretty smart. Now, Jesus picks up and he says, now, the boys and girls, the story's over. Here's what I want you to learn from. it." Look what he says in verse number nine. Read it out loud with me, would you please? And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. I'd like to encourage you, if not now, later, to underline that in your Bible. That verse is pivotal. Now, this is not, the story's over. Now, Jesus said, now that's the story. Let me tell you what I'd like to tell you that you ought to do as a result of the story. I say unto you, go out there into your community and make to yourselves friends using what the master has given you. And in particular, money. So that when you die, they will receive you into everlasting habitations. You know, do you know heaven is a real place? It's a real place. It's not a figment. You're not going to be laying on a cloud somewhere. You're not going to be just, just floating around. There are actually habitations. In my Father's house are many. There are places that live. You're going to have a glorified body. You're going to eat. Hallelujah. Right, Dick? You with me on that one? I'm glad you woke up for that one. That was good. Yes, when I said the word eat, he just woke right up and Char just didn't have to, she, she got startled over there. Nonetheless, uh, hey, he's, you're going to eat in heaven. You're going to have a place to live in heaven. There is a city, a new Jerusalem in heaven with 12 foundations. There is not, you're never going to get bored for all eternity. God spent six days making this planet and the celestial bodies He's been working on heaven for 2,000 years. It's going to be amazing. But there is places, and he says, listen, so use your money now. Go out and make your friends, make friends of, of unrighteous mammon. Use your money in a way in which you can have friends for eternity. So that when you do die and you do get fired from life, can I tell you something? All of us are going to get fired. You're go your heart's going to stop. You might live to be 71, 81, 91, but you're not going to be 121. Sometimes you're going, sometime between now and the next several years, you're going to get fired from living. And once you get fired, all of your money and all the things that you do are really done. So you have a choice in what's going to happen there, but your only choice to make is while you're still breathing. You're still living. And while your boss hasn't called you in yet. See, you have been forewarned. I have been forewarned. You're going to get fired. I'm going to stop making you a steward. But right now, John Wilkerson is a steward. Bob Weir is a steward. Matt Reynolds, he's a steward. You are a steward. And, and you're still on, you still have opportunities. And you still have stuff. You still have a body, you still have training, you still have a voice, you still have feet, you still have hands. 
You still have money. You still have a, uh, the ability to get wealth and work. Now what are you going to do with that time? Because in just a few days, the boss is calling you back in. It's appointed a man wants to die. And after that, an evaluation. Now I'm never going to be judged for my sin. I should be. I should be judged at the, at the great white throne judgment and cast in the lake of fire. But that's not going to happen for me, not because of who I am, but because of who took my sin. But I am going to give an account for my works and my love for the Lord. And for everything, even every idle word. I'm going to give an account for the time I used, for what I did, for every dime that went through these fingers and this hand, for every dollar that went into my pocket, for my Saturdays, for my Sundays, for my Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays, for my family, for my possessions, for my influence. Stewardship is a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-week evaluation. He says in, in regards to finances, you need to use, this is one of the reasons why I, I, I really, quite frankly, encourage us to give to world evangelism. Because I think it's one of the strongest ways as an American in this time of history that you and I can make eternal friends. As a result of supporting one Swahili missionary last week, people went over there to the State of Crusade. We made as a church family, in part, and we weren't the only ones supporting that thing, but primarily, 1,639 new friends. That their life expectancy is a lot less than yours. A Tanzania who gets cancer is probably not going to make it. They're not going to go to chemotherapy. They're not going to have radiation. They're, it's just if you get sick, your average age is probably they're going to die. Most of them die before they're 50 years old. And they're, most of them are going to go, of those 1,639 people there, many of them will go to heaven before I do. And the Bible, if the Bible is true, they will receive me into everlasting habitations. Not because I preach here at First Baptist Church of Hammond, but because in heaven the books are open. I give my offering, you give your offering, but we put it upside down so we don't want to be embarrassment to somebody and don't want to do that. And that's not bad to do that. I don't think in the Bible that's really a requirement. I think probably we ought to be much more uh, aware of the givers in our church. If you, if you want someone who's a prayer warrior, most of you could find someone in this room who's a prayer warrior. If you say, you know, I want to I learn how to go soul winning, you could probably point to someone and say, that's a soul winner. We don't do a lot of giving examples, but we ought to do more. And, and once again, not so we brag, because he said, look, if you're giving for the praise of men, that's when it's wrong. God knows the heart. You might remember Jesus watched people give. We've got people in this room right now who give $700 a week to missions. There are people in this room that if there's something to be done, they're always looking for a way in which they can, they can give that. Whenever God blesses them, they, they want to be a channel. If there's something going on, they're the first one back to the Welcome Center looking. There might be some kids that might get saved out of thing, and they, we, can, we can instantly affect nine other cities and a families in other cities that I will never meet this side of heaven. But if 20 bucks will buy a Gatorade and a gospel track and a DVD of message of a preaching someone the gospel, then I want to be a part of that. Where is that going to, where are they taking that money? And others of us, we're not interested in that. That's the last thing in our mind because we don't see it. We see it as just a, they're trying to get more money out of me. No. It's an investment. They're making eternal friends. And I'm not saying that tonight for you to give extra to that. I'm just telling you, every, it takes money to get people saved. Nobody got saved for free. So I got saved in my home. Someone just came and told me. Well, you know, you took gasoline to get from where they were to you. Somebody paid for that gasoline. This auditorium, we light it up on a, and, and warm it in the winter or cool it in the summer. It's about $1,800 for a two-hour service. That doesn't happen for free. And hundreds and thousands of people have walked down here and heard the gospel in this room and came from the balconies and, 
and to get saved. And those, that water it, that heats up there, that doesn't happen for free. Nips go to say, you know what, you're doing baptizing? Let's do that for free. No, no, no. No, the, the, the fuel, the gas that goes to keep those baptistries, and we saw people get baptized this morning. May see someone get baptized tonight. Hey, that happens because there's money. Money and men and materials and media, all of those things are used of God. And God says, use your funds to make eternal friends so that when you die, they will receive an everlasting. But many of us, we struggle with the fact that there's really going to be everlasting habitations. Can I trust God? Then I didn't say this. Do you guys have a red letter edition in your Bible? Can you tell me what verse number nine is? Is it red or black? And if it's red, what does that mean? That means that Jesus said it. He said, here's the analogy. There is a heaven, there is an everlasting habitation, and you are responsible while you're living in this world to use what I've given you to get someone else to Jesus. So that when you die, they'll receive an everlasting habitation. That's the mission field, that's gospel tracts, that's giving, that's... Little league, that's whatever. But it will take that. That's why I want to give to offerings. That's why I want to give to mission. Because I believe in all my heart that there are people around the world. And I've had the joy to travel this world. And go places I never dreamed. I never got on an airplane until I was 19 years old. I never stayed in a hotel room until I was on my honeymoon. I was a poor boy. Never thought I would travel anywhere. But I've now seen the world in many places of the world, and I've seen what happens when a Zach Faust gets up and, and tells people about Jesus Christ in Peru and seeing people get saved. I've seen what happens when we go to Thailand and Hua Hin or where Brother Eddie Errol is and the Wong, and I see them go to these houses and these little places. I've been to the Philippines and seen people get saved with a chicken right beside them. And in, a, in a, a roof that just doesn't even, the wall house doesn't have walls on it, just to lean tos and hear little people sit down there with a, with a mud floor, hear the gospel of Christ. And Brother De Moville shared the gospel of Christ, and two or three people heard them call out to the Lord Jesus Christ. But they can't be there unless I give here. I've been to Ghana, seen people after a service line up all the way to the back sides of those things, and People give them the gospel of Christ. Tomorrow, I'll step off the plane in Mexico City and we'll see Brother Kevin Wynn. We've supported him for years. And I'll see people come forward and get saved and get baptized. And soul winners all over that place. I'll see a whole section of Jewish people that sit in the back. And you can tell they're Jewish. They've, they've got the Jewish garb, but they've accepted Jesus as their Messiah. Because of soul winners in Mexico City telling the Jewish people about Christ. And I have a part in that. I don't know their name. But they're going to be my eternal friends. Because the opportunity to share in that, in that process. In closing, let's just finish the, the next few thoughts here. Jesus continues his thoughts in verse number 10. And I'm done. And he says, he that is what? And that which is, is faithful also in much. And he is unjust in the least, is unjust also in much. So, uh, this is a challenge for us to be faithful in the little things. The small things that God, you may perceive this, they're just details, they're so small. It's like walking by a piece of trash on the, on the sidewalk, and I could pick it up or I could just keep on going. It's like fixing your songbook where you leave, small stuff. Things I know I should do, and I just, I need to do it. It might be I don't get to speak at the nursing, center, a nursing home, but I get to stand over here and help someone hold their book, or sit beside someone and hold their hand while they're listening to the message. It's little things. He said, he that is faithful and that was his least is faithful also in much. So he's looking for how we handle little things. Verse number 11, read it with me if you would please. Ready? If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous, who will commit to your trust true riches? Now, unrighteous mammon means money. Is that if you're not faithful to do what God tells you to do with your money, who will give you true riches? Now, I don't know exactly what true riches are, but my opinion are, is that true riches are influenced with people. The only thing that transitions eternity is you and me and people. You, you don't take money with you. You don't take your house with you. You don't take your cars with you. You take people with you. 
Those are the true riches. But not everyone has the influence on people they could have. But God says, if you can't handle a dime, why will I give you somebody to influence for Christ? Some of the problems with our soul winning and our influence in getting people to the gospel of Christ revolves around our handling of our paycheck, our finances. Some of us, the reason we struggle with influencing people for the gospel of Christ and God giving us true riches oftentimes rest in our inability to see our finances the way God wants us to see it. That's a challenge. We live and God says you are strangers and pilgrims. A pilgrim mentality. This world is not my home. Tomorrow morning I had the opportunity to get on an airplane. If I were sitting on the airplane, and I'm going to go with Brother Tim Ray, Brother Tim Ray's going to go and, and keep me straight on this trip. But if, I, if he's over there and he said, you know, and he starts opening his briefcase and putting up a curtain on the side of the, uh, the airplane and some pictures and stuff around there, hanging some pictures and, 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 and decorating his little side of the airplane there where he's sitting up against the window. And I say, Tim, what in the world are you doing, brother? He goes, oh, I just, I want to really enjoy this trip and... I'm, I'm just going to, and, and maybe they're expensive pictures. I'm saying, what are you doing? You know what we're on this plane to do? We're going to, to go from Chicago's O'Hare Airport to Mexico City. That's it. This is just a vehicle to get us from point A to point B, Tim. This is not, this is not to decorate this area. This is just to, this is a vehicle. You know what life is? Life is a vehicle. Life is is what we use to get from here to turn. You know, life, stewardship of life is the prelude. Eternity is the book. Life is the warm-up. Eternity is the concert. Life is the practice. Eternity is the game. That's where it all matters right there. That's why Jesus said, lay up for your treasures in Set your affections on things, not on things. Apostle Paul, when it came to giving, he said, look, this is expedient for you. Do this for eternity's sake. And Jesus says, you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. You're unjust in a little bit, you'll be unjust in much. If you're always looking for the next level and when I'm going to be able to do this and that, you might want to just find out what you're supposed to do and be really good at that. And what's the eyes of the Lord come over to your way? Promotion does not come from a man. does not come from the east or the west. It comes from the Lord. Then we find that the Bible tells us, if you're not going to handle your, your unrighteous mammon, who would give you eternal results in the lives of people? By the way, who's the only one that can do that? All the Father cometh to me, all the Father giveth me, cometh to me, and him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. Every, uh, cast out. Uh, he says that no man cometh unto me unless the who draws them. The Father draws them. He's the one who brings them. And he says, look to your financial things. I, I would think all of us need to do a checkup from the neck up, and especially in these areas of our time. Our, our treasures, but start with your money. And I, and I say that not for any other reason, but to benefit us. You might remember in, in the book of Malachi, and I've, I've gone too long, but the book of Malachi, God says, you have gone away from me. Your fathers have gone away from me. And they said, from whence can we return? How can we get back to you? And you know what? If someone came to me and said to me, Pastor, I'm away from God. I want to come back to the Lord. What do you think I should do? I'd probably say, well, you know, be a faithful to church, read your Bible, pray. You know what God said? He touched on something that really said, you know what? How, okay, how can we get back to you? He said, you have robbed me. And they said, come on, wherein have we robbed you? He said, in tithes and offerings. He said, now you're cursed with a curse, even this whole nation. He said, here's what you can do. You can bring the tithes into the storehouse so there might be meat in my house and prove me here right now. Prove me now. I love those, two, those three words together. Prove me now. That's four words, isn't it? Now. When should I start tithing? Now. When should I, I test the Lord out on this? Right now. 
and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you in a blessing you'll have room to receive it. And I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake and, and I'll protect the fruit of your ground and, and you'll have your vine, your, 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 your fruit will not cast forth her, 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 her fruit in the field before it's time. You'll have what you need when you need it. So many blessings. But the first thing you talked about is finances. He says, look, if you can't handle unrighteous man, who will give you a trust to riches? And he goes on and, and we'll read these and I'll conclude. Verse number 11 uh, verse 12, for if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, if you've not been a good steward, who shall give you that which is your own? And that's what I do believe. In this life, we're stewards. In the next life, we have an opportunity to be an owner. Right now, I'm totally a steward. I own nothing. But I believe that God has intent for you to have something that is your own. But he is using this life to evaluate that. Then he says in verse number 13, no man can serve two masters. There'll have to be a decision made. For either we will hate the one, love the other, or else we'll love the one, despise the other, who you cannot serve God and, and mammon or money. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts. And I pray you'd help us. I pray this would just jog my mind, my thoughts. Help me. I pray you'll do the same thing for Linda and for Lydia and Drew and Coleman and Judson and Mason. Lacey. I pray we'll do the same thing for the staff and for the deacons and for our men and our ladies and for our teenagers and our children, for our senior citizens. May each of us, Lord, evaluate what does it mean to be a steward? And what does it mean to be a steward of the God of heaven? Help us, Lord, to exercise wisdom, to realize the accountability, the responsibility to realize that you are a good God. You're very generous. You're very gracious. And you're a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. Help me to have wisdom in my finances and my, my time, my talents. Lord, I pray that you'd help me do an evaluation so that you can be glorified through the salvation of many and friends can be made now and for all eternity, I pray.